Woodshed, a little confused on where to go here. Jalen Sherrod, the ball's taken away. Williams arcs it up, oh! wins the basket. Hey folks, Mr. Bowtie here. Keep banging home that red subscribe button on your screen so that way you can stay up to date on all the great local sports coverage that TV and radio refuse to cover. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. It's been tough, but, you know, a shaky start, but we're glad to be back, back home, back in Maples and uh, finishing out these last few games and then heading, heading to San Antonio. Yeah, Texas, we've avoided a lot of the big issues. We've got our football season in. They're adjusting the basketball tournaments here at the high school level. But I know in California, they didn't get to play a, their high school football season out there. For, the, for those who maybe haven't paid much attention, describe some of that craziness being out in California right now. Yeah, so um, I got back to California uh, in September, and um, one of the first things I did was I went to a Red Lobster to, to get some food. And uh, when I walked in, I realized that, you know, the like the chairs were on top of each other. Um, they were like blocked off. You couldn't walk into the seating area. And uh, I realized that they were, you know, in a, a, a like a lockdown almost. Um, you couldn't eat in restaurants. Uh, it's still some restaurants you can't eat in until today. So just knowing that difference between California and Texas, I feel like they're two different, they're obviously are two different states, but like they're within this, this pandemic, their approach is really different. I feel like Texas is more wide open. California is being more conservative and having stuff locked down. Um, so just with that in mind, and uh, like you said, we, we went on a lockdown and we couldn't play in our arena. So, you know, we had to go to Santa Cruz, um, which is a, another county, not in Santa Clara. Uh, thankful for the Warriors G League uh, facility for letting us uh, have our home games there. Um, but now that we're back, uh, this, the numbers aren't great, but they're better than what they were. So we're back in Maples, uh, back using our weight room, our, our practice gym, um, back in our dorm room. So it, it's been a ride, but uh, we're, we're glad to be back. Yeah, I spent a lot of time uh, covering Juco ball and also when uh, I was at Incarnate Ward. And the one thing that you learn about the smaller leagues is it's kind of a bus league where you spend hours and hours on a bus. But in the bigger conferences, you spend a lot of time on planes. How has that helped bond the team together where you're living a lot of the season out of a suitcase? Yeah, I, I think um, that was one of the bright sides, us living out of a, a hotel. Um, we spent a lot of time together uh, down in Santa Cruz. You know, we're only a few blocks away from the beach. So, you know, after we get tested before practice, a few of us will walk to the beach. Um, you know, obviously we didn't have cars or anything. So um, we just, you know, found ways to, to be creative and spend time together with one another. And I think ultimately that that time uh, off the court, uh, us building relationships with one another has helped us on the court. Um, and yeah, you know, living out of a hotel, it's not ideal, but that's how bad we wanted to play. So, you know, they wouldn't let us play here. So we have to, you know, put all our stuff in a suitcase and, and get going. <laughs> It's been a very unusual year in women's basketball. For years, Connecticut was the dominant number one, and we've seen several teams, Stanford included, that have been at number one throughout the season. There's not really a dominant team this year, and it seems like the tournament's going to be a lot more wide open this year. Uh, I absolutely agree. Um, and, and then again, South Carolina just lost, I believe, on Monday. So I feel like this year it's up for grabs, and no one gets to you know host or – uh, seedings don't really matter. I think it's about who's playing their best basketball in March because the entire tournament's in San Antonio. Um, and hopefully, you know, we are that team that's, you know, playing their best basketball in March and the beginning of April. Yeah, the, the whole tournament outside of a few games coming to San Antonio, Greeley, St. Mary's going to host some. Uh, UTSA will host some. I think UT and uh, Texas State are going to host some. Usually for the women, the top 16 seeds get to host first and second rounds. I'm guessing when it was announced that that the whole turn was coming here to Texas, you're probably the happiest person in the room because you're like, hey, I get to go home. I don't get to play at home, but I get to play in my backyard. Absolutely. Um, I've actually been knowing that uh, the, the tournament was going to – well, the Final Four, I mean, the Final Four was going to be in San Antonio for about two years. So I've really been looking forward to this, but then when they announced the entire tournament was in San Antonio, um, started cheesing even harder. Um, extremely, uh, you know, happy to, to be going back home, uh, but I'm, I'm taking this as a, as a business trip. Um, yeah, I'm going to be at home with, with my family, but, uh, you know, we're still going to be in our, our, our bubble, as, as we call it, so I'm not going to be able to see them. 
hopefully they'll allow fans at the game so I could see them, you know, from a distance. But um, going back home, um, in my mind, it's a business trip and have some games to win. I'm sure we'll, you'll hear Christina Camacho somewhere at some – you probably still hear all the way from the Bay Area. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. She actually just texted uh, – she texted me, Amber, and uh, Sahara a few days ago. So, so it would be nice seeing her also. Yeah, this is going to be interesting because the tournament's here in San Antonio. People think about the Spurs and when the Silver Stars used to be here, but the girls' basketball is really getting better. You, uh, obviously, at Stanford, finishing up your time, getting ready to go to the pro ranks. And Alyssa Smith, still part of the defending champions at Baylor. Sahara Jones just won the uh, 5A Girls Basketball Player of the Year Award. We, we're noticing that the expectations are getting higher where instead of just getting to the state semis and getting blown out on Thursday or Friday by Houston or Dallas, that now the expectation is we're supposed to be playing on Saturday. We're supposed to give Duncanville and the Mansfield Timberviews and the Amarillo area the, uh, the uh, runs for their money. What have you noticed in the last few years of, with the girls basketball here in town? Oh, absolutely. You you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, there's been this reputation of Dallas and Houston teams always win the state tournament. Um, but, you know, Converse Judson won it a, a few years ago. And that's just a credit to the, the upcoming uh, talent in San Antonio girls basketball. And uh, a huge, huge part of that is my uh, old AU coach, Ray Caldwell, in the SA Finance program. Uh, he's, uh, you know, put out some of the best uh, college, college players, uh, high school players. And, us, me, Sahara, and Melissa, also Amber, all played under him, and he's uh, taking, uh, you know, AAU girls basketball to another level. What do you think has to be done in order to get more consistent state champions? It was great to see Judson win it two years ago, but people are saying it's a fluke because Duncanville wasn't there. What do you think has to be done in order to see more of these teams continue to get there and being able to have success actually winning the Golden Trapezoid? Um... You know, it, it's hard to say. Um, I feel like, you know, with the Dallas and Houston teams, uh, schools, I feel like, you know, it, it's it's kind of odd that all the good players end up on one team. And, you know, in San Antonio, that's kind of a red flag and that's kind of frowned upon. Um, but just, you know, I, I think just with the with AAU players developing their game in AAU and building that confidence and taking it over to their high school teams. And, you know, you, you have one or two good players on a team, maybe you can go all the way. Um, obviously that's what Converse Judson had. They had, I want to say three, four good, really good players and uh, took them all the way. But, um, you know, it, it takes a special group, uh, not only in high school, but also college, just, you know, winning, winning every, the, the entire thing. It's hard. You have to have that different level of focus and commitment, uh, but hopefully another San Antonio team can do it. And, of course, Southern Cal has one of those players that was on that Judson team. When you all are starting to assemble once the tournament gets started, because I know a lot of the local players still talk together, do you all see this as kind of your opportunity to go out there and say, hey, this is San Antonio, this is what this is what we have, we have a lot of great players. You all kind of feel like you and some of the other players are going to be those ambassadors? Oh, absolutely. Um I know, I know whenever I get a chance to say where I'm from, I say it loud and proud. Um, now my freshman year, they used to uh, tease me for saying I had this, this quote, I'm Keanu Williams from San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> but um, no, I, I uh, agree with what you just said. Um, you know, us being back home, I feel like, you know, a, a different spotlight is going to be back, be on us because we're, you know, back home in, in our hometown plan. Um, but just, you know, taking that for, for what it is and, uh, you know, I'm not trying to prove people wrong, but prove ourselves right that, you know, we are, you know, the, the faces of, of the city uh, right now. Yeah, and the, these players aren't just on bad teams or at the tail end of D1. Stanford going to be in the tournament. Alyssa Smith, Baylor, the defending champions. Sahara Jones, Texas A&M, we know they're going to be a part of the tournament. So it's kind of showcasing that the, these this area of talent, not just bench warmers on bad teams, but actually starters and sixth men on these good teams that have a chance to win the title. Uh, absolutely. I, I agree with everything you just said. What do you think is going to be the key for you in order to have a chance for Stanford to win the title? Because we know you're going to have to deal with potentially South Carolina, UConn, potentially see Baylor and Alyssa or A&M and Sahara, where we're actually going to have the probably the most competitive women's turn we've seen in quite some time. Uh, I think March is all about taking it one possession at a time, uh, one game at a time, um, you know, it's easy to, to look long term and try to, you know, focus on who you're going to be playing down the line. But I feel like with the entire tournament being in San Antonio, you can't look at a team and what numbers in front of them. You know, 
we could be a one seed, a two seed, playing a 16th seed or a 15th seed, and you can't look at that team or, oh, they're, they have a lower seed, they're not as good. Um, anything's possible. You know, we lost to unranked Colorado, and I think uh, we learned from that, taking them lightly and them being unranked. Uh, I think March is all about who wants it more. So just me being a senior, having the most experience on my team, um, I look – you know, last year, you know, our freshmen didn't get to experience the tournament because it was canceled. And then our freshmen this year, this is going to be their first tournament. So we have two great classes that haven't yet experienced the tournament and they don't really, you know, know that feeling of it's, you know, do or die. Every game could be your last. So I think just making sure that message is across to our young players and uh, me and my other uh, fellow senior captains, making sure everyone's locked in. Uh, it's going to be a grind, but it's also going to be fun. So. You think it's also going to be an adjustment to a new normalcy? Because, again, the top 16 usually hosts. You get three that come in. You win two games. You go to a predetermined regional. You think it's just going to be having to adjust to where all 64 teams are on the road and, and everybody's playing at a neutral site? I don't think it'll be an adjustment for us because, obviously, you know, we had to do that living out of, our ho living out of a hotel uh, earlier this year. Uh, we were playing at, you know, the Warriors G League facility, but, you know, it was our home gym, but we, it felt like a neutral site to us because, you know, we didn't have fans. So I think for us, in a way, we had kind of have an advantage because we've already been, you know, on the road, quote unquote, uh, living out of a suitcase. So uh, maybe, you know, that that adversity that we went through earlier in the year can help us, you know, uh, in San Antonio. Final question. We mentioned about how San Antonio is getting better. We know Judson ISD kind of has led the whole thing. You, along with when Camacho was coaching at Wagner, kept getting to the semifinals. And then when Veterans Memorial opened, she went there and has taken them to the finals twice. Judson has been there, I think, the last four years. And if not for Duncanville, they probably would have won it every time. What does that say about Judson ISD kind of leading this charge where we're seeing North side getting better. We're seeing Northeast getting better where it's kind of Fredericksburg's getting better where y'all have kind of led that charge. Um, I think Justin ISD has, has some of the best athletes in San Antonio. That's not a knock to any of the other school districts, but um, I think, uh, you know, with, with Wagner uh, now veterans and uh, Judson, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people know about the history behind Judson and, and Wagner, uh, whether it's football, basketball, track, um, and with Camacho over at Veterans, she's taking that program, the women, uh, girls basketball program to, to uh, state. It's just a credit to, you know, the amazing uh, athletes as well as coaches. And, um, you know, their, Camacho just has that experience and she, she knows how to get there. So she leads her team. Yeah, I'm sure you and Sahara probably have traded back and forth some stories of Camacho. I, I'd love to hear one. We all know her very well, but I got to hear one of those great Camacho stories from when you were when she was coaching you at Wagner. Oh, um, so this story is actually right. Well, I think I was in the seventh or eighth grade. Um, uh, I was at uh, I was at Metzger at the time, and I, this is my very first time. I don't, this wasn't my first time meeting Camacho, but it was one of my first times meeting her. And um, I, I walked into their, to her practice gym. They were getting ready to start their playoff run, and uh, she asked me to to practice with the players. And you know, I'm a little seventh, eighth grader, little skinny kid. I'm, I'm looking at the high schoolers like they're, you know, they're big dogs. You know, they're getting ready to go on a, a state run. I don't want to practice with them. Uh, so just her having that confidence in me and, you know, trying to will me in, uh, you know, right before I got there. Um, that's one of my favorite memories of Camacho. You know, she has confidence in her players and uh, just, you know, Sahara being player of the year last year is just credit to the confidence that she had in her and letting her, her do what she does best. So um, really love Coach Camacho. Um, I hate she left my senior year, but uh, she's doing a great job over at Veterans. Keanu Williams, appreciate the time. Obviously, best wishes uh, for the rest of the season as well as when we see in San Antonio. Thanks so much for the time. No problem. Thank you.